Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the entire organization of CMRE for allowing me to talk on this topic, which is quite dear to me. Uh, and I also apologize that the start of it gets a little bit of bit too much of cardiology and a little less bit of glycemia and glycemic control. So moving on. So to start off with, what exactly is heart failure? We all know that heart is a pump. Its job is to pump blood throughout the body. And if the pump doesn't work, we say that the pump is failing and that is heart failure. So is that true? Well, I would say that is partly true. In fact, during the Framingham Heart Study itself, the basic definition was laid and where it said that it is a condition where the heart is unable to pump blood to meet the hemodynamic demands of the body or is able to do so at raised filling pressures. Now, the second part of it, whether it, where it is able to do so at raised filling pressure is something which we miss out quite a lot. And that's not our fault. Because all the time when we look at all the books that have been taught to us, whether it's Genon, Guyton and Hall, all those books from physiology from back in the day, we always discuss inotropy, chronotropy, bathmotropy, and dromotropy. But wait a minute. But what about lucitropy? We don't need to wait to get to cardiology and then uh, talk about lucitropy. So the reason is that heart actually actively also fills. It's not a passive process. It is an active process. And that is called lucitropy. And if the heart is unable to fill, actively, then it causes preserved ejection fraction or diastolic dysfunction as we know it. So heart failure is classified on the basis of ejection fraction into three parts, into three types. So it is reduced ejection fraction with an ejection fraction less than 40% or preserved ejection fraction, which is ejection fraction more than 15%, 50%. So now this area between 40 to 49% has been masquerading as different names. Initially, it was called mild uh, reduced mild uh, this thing uh, mild heart failure. Then it was called heart failure with mid range mid range ejection fraction. And now, currently, it's finally called as heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. The reason for calling it that way is because it is more closer to reduced ejection fraction than it is to preserved ejection fraction. So, a little bit on the epidemiology and natural history of heart failure. Uh, the, it has a quite a high incidence of 3 per 1,000 person years. It has a prevalence of around 2%, which means around 2.5 to 3 crore of our Indian population is suffering from heart failure. And it increases significantly with age, for, as, with the prevalence being less than 1% at an age of less than 55 years. And it jumps up to more than 10% for age more than 70 years. And in the original Framingham Heart Study, the five-year mortality rates were quite high. The rates were 63% then. And a recent Olmsted County cohort showed that even now with slightly better therapies, the mortalities are at one year is around one fifth and around at five years, 50% of people will, not, will die. The rate of hospitalization is very high. It is 1.3 per person years. And also in diabetics, hospitalization rates are much higher the 1.5 times compared to the person who's a non-diabetic. Uh, despite having coming a long way in the treatment and management of heart failure, it continues to be a major risk factor for morbidity and cardiac events. The cardiovascular death and hospitalization rates have been have still been high despite better medical therapy. In fact, the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, which was which included the wonder drug Arnie, despite including Arnie, the rate of cardiovascular deaths at three years was still 13%. And if you look at it, it is as bad as any other malignant disease. Because all our cancers also have similar mortality rates. So how does diabetes affect the heart? It causes coronary artery disease because of increased atherosclerosis. It leads to heart failure by its direct effect leading to diastolic and systolic dysfunction. It leads to arrhythmias in the heart, such as atrial fibrillation. And along with that, we know that risk of embolic events, such as stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation, is much higher for a patient who is a diabetic. Along with that, it has its own impact on the kidneys and it leads to a condition known as a cardiorenal syndrome, which again leads to a lot of trouble for the heart. So basically, if you look at it, the heart, the diabetes, diabetes is acting on the pump, which is our heart. It also is affecting our pipes, which is the macro and the microvasculature. And it is also affecting, the kid, uh, affecting our filter, which is kidney. So heart failure in diabetes happens to be one of the most common cardiovascular complications. It is a disabling and deadly complication of diabetes. It has very high rates of subclinical heart failure and diastolic dysfunction. And in fact, the effect of glucose lowering agents vary quite a lot because heart failure in itself is an inflammatory condition and it leads to insulin resistance. 
diabetics uh, diabetes increases the risk of heart failure by five times in comparison to patients who do not have diabetes and patients with diabetes tend to have much worse outcomes than patients who don't so classically heart failure has been classified by nyha classification since it was orig- since it originated in the 1920s but unfortunately this is pretty much based for the treatment of patients and how patients respond to treatment so it's all symptom based but there is it, the prevention side of things cannot be taken care of if we get kept on with this classification so recently aha introduced a new staging system where heart failure is staged as from a b c and d where stage a is a patient who's at high risk for heart failure but does not have any structural heart disease which means any patient who has any risk factor for developing heart disease whether it is diabetes whether it is hypertension whether it is uh, dyslipidemia all of these patients happen to be in stage a and if we look at them as a patient who's been who's in stage a for heart failure we should we need to act upon them early so that we can prevent them from developing heart failure then stage b includes patients who have structural heart disease but have never developed symptoms stage c is patients who are having structural heart disease and who have developed symptoms whether they are on or off therapy and stage d includes patients who are refractory with refra- uh, refractory heart failure uh this multicentric study atherosclerotic risk in multiple communities uh, which was more, which included more than 100000 patients showed that diabetes was one of the most important one of the most strongest modifiable risk factors for heart failure now why is all of this important now heart failure in itself is something which cheats away in a person's life and it also cheats away on their pocket being a chronic disease requiring multiple hospitalization long duration medication it's not something which is a very easy thing for a patient or for the family and in fact over the years as a therapy for heart failure or heart attacks has improved a lot which has made the survival of such patients much much more than what it was previously the burden of heart failure has increased and along with that even the longevity of patients who are now living beyond 75 to 80 ha- has increased a lot which is also added to the burden of heart failure so now we usually think about heart failure as being a problem which is more seen in men and slightly less in women and here we can see that it is relatively similar and heart failure is definitely the most common cause of cardiovascular related hospitalization be it men or women even though the substrate is slightly different men tend to present with reduced ejection fraction more whereas women tend to present more with preserved ejection fraction if you look at the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetics a systematic review showed that heart failure is seen in approximately 30% of patient in patients in america and coronary artery disease is seen about 20% of patients in 20% of diabetics so how exactly does diabetes cause all these problems to the heart uh, it increases atherosclerosis which leads to ischemic cardiomyopathy it also causes arterial dysfunction which may lead to hypertension which leads to hypertensive cardiomyopathy along with that it causes microvascular dysfunction in the heart and it causes changes in cardiac metabolism which lead to diabetic cardiomyopathy which includes diastolic dysfunction as in the early part and then later on into systolic dysfunction so clearly diabetes just does not cause heart failure because of atherosclerotic uh, processes atherosclerotic mediated processes lead to myocardial infarctions which lead to reduced ejection fraction whereas other non atherosclerotic uh, pathways such as metabolic dysfunction and microvascular uh, mas- microvascular involvement leads to diastolic dysfunction so here we see that di- di- diabetes is uh, one of the most common causes for both reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction which leads to heart failure hospitalization and death so is heart failure uh, one second so heart failure is it an early and a forgotten complication in diabetics well let's see uh, if when patients of an diabetics was uh, underwent screening and it was seen that there around 28% of them happened to have undiagnosed undiagnosed heart failure and 68% of diabetics at the end of 5 years would have lv dysfunction and only one third of them will not have lv dysfunction which is a very high rate so it's not just that heart failure is seen in diabetics it's also that diabetes is very commonly seen in heart failure patients 
in the charm study disc glycemia was very frequently represented in both reduced ejection fraction and the preserved ejection fraction groups in fact disc glycemia was seen in about 85% patients in reduced ejection fraction and around 80% in preserved ejection fraction so type 2 diabetes increases rehospitalization rates it is also predictive for readmissions it is independently associated with rehospitalization and the rehospitalizations tend to be much longer other features of diabetes and heart failure include the patients have worse symptoms or function class they have worse renal functions they have more autonomic dysfunction they have more pulmonary hypertension they have impaired arterial vasodilatation they have greater lv diastolic dysfunction they have abnormal myocardial metabolism so what are the symptoms of heart failure originally classified by nyha were dyspnea fatigue palpitations and angina recently who added syncope other symptoms also include weight gain pedal edema abdominal distension weight loss cough tachypnea orthopnea pnd time stokes breathing etc so the diagnosis of heart failure is pretty much based on the signs and symptoms along with that any imaging proof of heart failure or any biochemical proof of heart failure so symptoms like i just mentioned previously could be breathlessness pedal edema fatigue angina palpitations and or anything we can see the ejection fraction through imaging using eco scans or any cardiac mri and the, for biochemical assessment we can use elevated bnp or elevated nt pro bnp so the management of heart failure consists of firstly we should look whether we can whether this is a reversible problem or not if it is a reversible problem we should consider all therapies which should reverse it secondly we need to we look at decongestion for the patient which helps in symptomatic improvement then we have guideline directed medical therapy which has which has been proven to have mortality benefit and then next after that we have devices for improvement of heart failure management and if <coughs> nothing works we have heart transplant and ventricular assist devices so gdmt includes beta blockers rne ace inhibitors or arbs or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or we have sglt2 inhibitors so what should be the strategy for heart failure management well today they say that the, there should be a sledge hammer approach there should be aggressive titration a patient should be followed up every 3 days for appropriate titration we should titrate up to the maximum tolerated dose of our guideline directed medical therapy which includes the four uh, uh, subsets which i mentioned previously and along with that we have other supplemental therapies but these supplementary therapies do not have any mortality benefit the inotropes just reduce hospitalization diuretics only improve symptom class evabradine only decreases hospital rehospitalization rate digoxin again only reduces rehospitalization rate and iron supplementation only improves the function classification to mention it again out of these five none of them have any mortality benefit so what about the devices if despite three months of optimal medical therapy at maximal tolerable doses a patient does not have any symptomatic uh, improvement or does not have any improvement in the ejection fraction it is time to consider them for an icd or a crtd if the patients continue to remain symptomatic patients are to be advised for a heart transplant or a ventricular assist device but the problem with diabetics is that diabetics with more than one end organ damage are considered a contraindication for heart transplant and they're only left with the option for a ventricular assist device and therapies for ventricular assist device are very rare in our country the costs are very enormous anywhere ranging between 80 lakhs to 1 crore so moving on to the wonder sglt2 that we have now and how it has evolved over the ages from being a medication which was initially used for patients who were in stage a and stage b of heart failure to now being a central medic uh, central part of the therapy for patients who are in stage c and stage d initially in the canvas declared to be 58 and the empiric outcome where patients with known diabetics with some sort of heart failure were uh, were tried with canagliflozin or empagliflozin and they showed pretty good outcomes and from now to from there we've come to a point where we've come to dapa heart failure which has said that these medicines are good whether the patient is diabetic or non diabetic so how does sglt2 work very briefly sglt2 reduces preload and afterload by decreasing plasma volume and decreasing vascular resistance 
it decreases the reliance on uh, fatty acids and increases ketone body formation which improves myocardial metabolism it de- it helps in cardiac remodeling by decreasing inflammation and fibrosis and decreasing cardiac stress so the landmark trial of dapa hf which was published in 2019 and then 2020 as well which showed that dapa glifosin had <clears throat> mortality benefits and ho- reduced hospitalization rate whether a patient was uh, a diabetic or a non diabetic and a huge subset of this population was patients who were already on other good drugs or on optimal doses of drugs such as arnes and beta blockers including carvedilol and also on aldactone so we can see that uh, patients who were on dapagliflozin in this trial showed significant re- re- reduction in their hospitalization rate which was around 30% and cardiovascular death was also reduced by around 18% in fact the meta analysis at po- at this point in time show that rehospitalization rates are reduced by around 20 to 22% and uh, cardiovascular death is reduced around 10 to 15% or this is on top of all the other gdmt So, what about the diabetic management in patients with heart failure? So, we can have two strategies. One was the intensive strategy, where the target HbA1c was less than six point five percent. Now, we also have a linear glycemic control strategy with an HbA1c of less than seven percent. As per the huge accord trial and also the advanced trial, there was a slight increase in mortality in the intensive control group. Currently, as per the AHA, the target for HbA1c for heart failure patients is seven percent. in patients with significant comorbidities and short life span a liberal strategy with an hba1c less than 8% is better so moving to the management of diabetes and heart failure here's the tricky part because <laughs> i'll come to that so metformin is still safe and it is recommended in all patients with heart failure who have an egfr more than 30 ml per kg per minute it is similar to how we use aspirin for coronary artery disease then dpp4 in some trials there were some associations with increased heart failure hospitalization they are currently not recommended for any reduction in mortality in heart failure glp1 agonist reduce the risk of mi stroke and cardiovascular death but they still don't reduce any incidence of heart failure which is a little paradoxical because mi stroke mi and cardiovascular death stroke they're all more linked towards reduced ejection fraction but it does not help with preserved ejection fraction hence the numbers are the same insulin also has a risk of sodium retention but it does not increase the risk of heart failure and it is recommended that patients who are started on insulin with heart failure should be monitored at the start in case they are going happening in, in case they are developing any sodium and water retention sulfonylureas are associated with a higher risk of heart failure events and are not recommended thiazolidine diones cause sodium and water retention and are and and are at an increased risk of worsening heart failure and hospitalization and then definitely contraindicated SGLT2 inhibitors have stood the test of time and they're currently the drug of choice. In fact, they're also strongly recommended for use in heart failure patients even without diabetes. Uh, that's all for me. From me, thank you so much for being a great audience.